Isn't it good to be together in the house of the Lord? I know Chris asked that a few weeks ago. And where is the house of the Lord? In us. Let us pray, brothers and sisters. Father, help us to taste and see that you are good. Help us to adore you. As we have just saying, God, we want to worship you. We want to glorify you. Help me, Father, with my words to do so this morning. What you wish for us to learn at West Highland Church this morning, teach us. And what you wish for us to apply in our lives, God, instruct us. So that we are not only hearers, Father, but indeed doers of your word. We pray in your holy, wonderful, and mighty name. Amen. So perhaps like me, you enjoy movies more than books. For our daughter, Olivia and Don, she's more, they're more book people. But one thing is for sure, as soon as I see five words at the beginning of a movie, my attention goes from interested to very interested. And I think you know what the five words are. Based on a true story. Are you like me? As soon as I see that, my interest peaks. And this morning's true story comes from the book of Luke 15, so please turn with me in your Bibles, and we will unpack that together. But I want you to pay attention that not only is this a true story, this has been called the greatest short story ever. Well, the question is, why? And I think like most great stories, when we can see ourselves in the characters, our interest even escalates further. And this morning's parable is found in Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. But the first point you'll see come up on the screen here is the word, the context. And in order to go forward, we have to look backwards. And so in Luke 15, verses 1 through 10, we have a backdrop which is critically important for us to understand. So Luke 15, 1 through 7, we have the parable of the lost sheep. You know the parable, right? <clears throat> one lost out of a hundred, one found rejoicing, right? And then we have the parable of the lost coin, verses eight through 10. Now this is one of 10 coins lost. And when the woman finds it, there's great rejoicing. And finally, we have the parable of the lost son. One out of two. And when he is found, there is great rejoicing. But, and the word but makes all the difference here. See, a great story typically has, and they lived happily ever after. Aren't those fun stories? But this story doesn't end that way. In fact, this story has a tragic ending. So look with me, if you will, at verses one and two of Luke 15. And notice two things. We have sinners and tax collectors on one side. And on the other side, we have Pharisees and we have scribes. And the sinners and tax collectors are drawing into Jesus. But in verse two, we see the tax collectors, or excuse me, the scribes and the Pharisees are grumbling and complaining. So two different groups of people. These two groups of people will be here through all three parables. And so the context we have here is two groups, two reactions, two outcomes. Verse six through seven, please look with me. This is the sheep. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or verse nine and 10, the second parable, and when she finds it, the lost coin, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over God, of God, over one sinner who repents. So the insuppressible joy of finding the lost item is the theme 
like a thread that goes through the tapestry through the three parables. The insuppressible joy of finding the lost item. The joy expressed in each parable is God delighting in sinners coming to saving faith. But something's different in the third story. This specific passage is referred to by Ralph Waldo Emerson and Charles Dickens as the greatest short story ever written or told more accurately. William Shakespeare borrowed from this great short story the motifs and the plots to help him form and shape the storyline for The Merchant of Venice. Rembrandt's most famous painting, one of them, was The Return of the Prodigal Son. Pastor Chris Kovac in his office downstairs has that painting hanging on the wall. No, it's not the original. Just in case you're wondering, but it's fascinating. The level of detail in there, I would encourage you to go look at it or look online. So John MacArthur, pastor and author, asks this one question. If we can have Emerson, and we can have Dickens, and we can have others, including Rembrandt, spending time dedicating their skill to either write about or paint about this specific story, what is it that makes the story so great? So that is the question that we will look to answer this morning. The greatest short story ever told, verses 11 through 32, second point. Luke 15 is a parable unit, as mentioned. It goes from 100, 1 to 10, 1 to 2. Do you notice the magnitude is increasing? 1%, 10%, 50%. So you have a magnitude increase here. Something is happening that Jesus is doing for the listeners. And he's not just speaking theoretically about what's happening. He's speaking directly to the people in front of him. For the tax collectors and the sinners are the younger son. The older brother are the Pharisees and the scribes. And the father is God himself. So the characters are now going to be unpacked for them and for us. Man's misery in being lost and God's joy in finding those who are lost will dominate this parable. This parable escalates from those who are lost, listen carefully here, naturally. So if you're a sheep, what is your job? You're naturally going to get lost. In fact, the shepherd's whole life is finding the sheep that naturally get lost. The woman loses a coin and the coin is lost helplessly. It has no ability to find itself, to take itself back, And finally, we have the third, not only escalating in percentages, but we have the third that's escalating willfully. So naturally, helplessly, willfully. See what a wonderful storyteller Jesus is? Amazingly, the people in front have no idea that he's speaking to them. He's actually inserting them. This is a true story with true characters. They've just changed the names to protect the not-so-innocent. And so here we are, we go to the first point, 2A, the lost, the younger son's rebellion. So the main character that shows up on the scene first is the younger son. You know the story, right? The younger son, in a culture of shame and honor. Now we live 2,000 plus years away from the story. But shame and honor dominated this culture then and dominate parts of the world now. And for a younger son to demand his estate portion prior to his father's death death was shameful. But here, the younger son comes to the father, calls him father at least, and says, give me my share of the estate. Let me give you this in modern terms. This would be like me saying to my father, dad, I wish you were dead, but because you're not, I would like some cash. In fact, I'd like you to take your will, dispose of your will now, because I don't want to wait until you eventually die. That's how shocking this statement is. And it doesn't come from the older brother, it comes from the younger brother. And the younger brother's share of the estate is one-third. 
the older brother's share of the estate is typically two-thirds. If anybody was to ask anything such as this, it should normally be from the older brother. But here, the younger brother comes to his father. Shameful. Equally shameful, guess what happens? The father agrees. See, the Pharisees and the scribes would have been throwing up their hands at the first part saying, obviously this is shameful. Obviously the father is going to reject the son, right? But that's not what happens. The father agrees, and in verse 12, second part, he divides his property to them. Do you notice what he says? Not to him, to them. The father complies to the demand of the younger son's premeditated plan, which now goes into actions as he has the means to do so. And so you see the father here does something according to the Pharisees and the scribes that would be equally shameful to the younger son. So not long after that, look at verse 13, what happens? The younger son takes all that he had. This is code for liquidation. So what's happened here is a fire sale. Typically wealth in those days, and not that dissimilar to today in Hamilton, often wealth is combined in our properties. And so for somebody to sell a property while alive, do you remember the year of the Jubilee and every 50 years land goes back to, this was prior to the year of the Jubilee. So what the implication here is that the father would have had to sell his property at some point along that continuum, perhaps at a lesser value. And the son takes his estate of the land and now liquidates it in a a fire sale. And now what happens if you have to get out fast? Has anybody ever had to do that? If you need to sell something fast, you generally don't do well in your sale, correct? And so what happened here is the son takes the money, lesser value, and he gets ready to run. And so the premeditated plan is in effect. Now not only does he have the means to do so, he has the motivation to do so. So, Look with me down to verse 13 and 14. Not long after that, the younger son got all he had together and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Let's stop right there. A far off country. Do you see the richness of the story? So Jews tended to live in an area and Gentiles, non-Jews, lived in other areas. So the son has now liquidated his share of the estate and decided he wants to go not to somewhere close to his family but far off, to Gentile land, to squander it in sinful living. And that's the backdrop. The son wanted not only to dishonor his father by demanding his share of the estate, he then quickly turns it into cold hard cash to go to a far off land and in essence destroys and burns his birthright in living in sinful ways. But before we're too quick to judge, friends, before we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we didn't want anything to do with God either. In fact, we wanted far away, did we not? Our lives, to varying degrees, were consumed with self, sinful desires. So let's be careful how quick we cast stones because we'll see quickly that the older brother was quick to be in judgment. Notice there's an absent member of the story so far. There's only three main players to the story. Two of them are there, but one of them is missing. Have you ever noticed that? The person that's actually missing in the story so far is the elder brother. Now in that culture of shame and honor, for the elder brother not to be present was shameful. His job was to protect the father's honor, and yet he's nowhere to be seen. The elder brother should have been saying, stop this, dad, this is crazy. Protect your honor, or going to his brother, but he's nowhere to be seen. The religious leaders were likely thinking, how shameful for what the younger son has asked, or how shameful for what the father has given, or how shameful the older brother's absence. 
but they didn't even realize that the net had been cast and they were the ones ready to be drawn in. And so in verse 14, things go from bad to worse. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the land. And he began to be in much need. In verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen in that country who sent him to feed the pigs in the field. Okay, so let's get context. If you think it's bad so far, so now he has squandered his estate, he is now in Gentile territory, and now he goes to the worst of the worst, according to them, in terms of cleanliness, would have been pig farmers, would have been the least clean. But here, we see he goes to them with a request. One of the authors, one of the commentaries said this well. They said, it's almost like somebody was begging and just kept showing up day after day. And eventually that person said, okay, come on. You can come on over here and work in the fields. But as we're going to learn, there wasn't even payment. Because if there was payment, he would have been able to earn food to be able to feed his stomach. So literally, he wants to get the scraps or the pods that the pigs are eating. That's the context. He's at the bottom of the barrel. And notice that the famine isn't just in this one region, it's the whole land. There's a point to this story. This would have been perceived by them then as the most vile of sinners possible. You have just blown dad's estate, you have just gone to a far off land, you've just lived wildly, blown through everything, no prudence, no investments, and now you're working for Gentiles and you're feeding pigs and you don't even have enough food for yourself. The younger son is at rock bottom and he knows full well that the errors of his sinful ways. Do you ever notice in great movies, the deepest darkness is right before the dawn? So in this story, we have that exact moment happening right here in verse 16 to verse 17. We can see that the plot is going to shift. Up until now, we've had this as a doom and gloom, but something is going to break. Look with me down to verse 17. And we read that he came to his senses. He realizes that his father's hired hands have food. And yet here he is starving among the pigs. So in verse 18, the younger son decides to go back to his father, but not as a son, for he has sinned against heaven and against his father. And here comes the repentance, point 2b. The son realizes he's not deserving based on what he has done to come back as what he was. So he decides he wants to come back not as a son, but as a servant or a slave. And the father, as we will see, has a different plan for him. This is a beautiful picture of repentance. And the key turning point to the entire parable is right here. That's where you and I, friends, were the moment we realized that our sins were against heaven and against God. That there was nothing that we could do to earn our salvation, no matter what we tried to do. And so here he is, destitute, realizing the error of his ways. He decides he's going to go back, not to ask to be restored, but for mercy from the Father. So he went up and got to his Father. He had no excuses. He was ready to accept the consequences of his actions. He had only confessions, and he goes to present his humble request. Look with me now to verse 20 through 24, the surprise. The right and the proper thing for the Father to do was this. Son, come home. Do not come and see me for the next three to four days. I am the power. You are not. You have sinned against me. You have squandered our wealth. And the show of power in that custom would have been the following. I may come and see you in three to four days. I'll have one of my servants come and get you to me. You'll sit generally at a lower place than me. And after you grovel, I may let you work in the fields as a servant. It might take 10 to 20 years, but you will never be fully restored. That's what the custom was. The level of sin that he has done against the family is unforgivable. It's unrepairable. But what do we see here? 
The father sees his son, notice what? At a distance. This is the key to the parable. The father isn't just walking through the field and happenstance sees the son. The father sees his son at a great distance, which implies that he's been looking for him every day, probably multiple times a day, watching the distance for his son to come back. And then he does the unthinkable of unthinkables. Now in our culture, if your dad came and ran to you, what would you think? That's fun, that's nice, a little odd perhaps, depending on your father. That's not what this culture was. A wealthy man never ran. A wealthy man never ran. And certainly never ran publicly. The ESV commentary on this gives some context as to why the wealthy man. Basically, the quick version of it is that they wore long robes and they were seen in a, in a sense of power. And so by running, what would happen is you would have people under you to, to run. Servants and slaves would do that kind of work, but you would walk dignified, held high, and you would only walk to there and it should be done in a dignified manner. But that's not what we see. The father here comes, sees his son at a far off land, and he runs to him. I visualize that I almost picture this as sprinting to the son. And the son, you can only imagine the reaction. So here's dad coming to me, running to me, and then what does the father do? He embraces him and he kisses him. These are both not to be done at this point. And so the surprise of all surprise is the father's forgiving reaction. So verse 21, the son tries his rehearsed speech, right? He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And the father, notice what happens, stops him. Because originally he was going to say to his father, and I'd like to work as a servant or a slave. But the father stops him halfway through the sentence and says, look, verse 22. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Now, again, context and culture mean something. So why a ring, why a robe, and why sandals? Here are the three reasons. The robe means authority. The ring means family. And the sandals mean that he is not a servant and he is not a slave. The only people in this culture that would walk around bare feet were typically servants. So here comes the pig-smelling, barefoot, destitute son hoping to work as a servant or slave. And the father doesn't even let him get the second part of his speech out of his mouth. He says, quick, bring a B, C, to his servants, not to his son, says it to his servants. And notice it's the word quick. It's instantaneous. So the father here wants restitution, full restitution immediately bestowed upon his son. Bring the fattened calf, verse 23, and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is now found. So they began to celebrate. Does this Remind you of the first two parables, right? Something lost is found, we celebrate. Something lost is found, we celebrate. Something lost is found, we celebrate. But the reason why this is the greatest short story ever comes in verses 25 to 32. For a tragic ending is ready to unfold. What an unbelievable picture of the gracious love that the fathers bestowed. For those of us here this morning, I want to read to you one scripture verse. We were in the same boat, were we not? We were once completely, utterly, hopelessly, helplessly lost. But for 1 Peter 3.18 states, for Christ once, what? Also suffered sins. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you and me to God. Praise the Lord. Amazing grace, such unspeakable grace, to save blind wretches like you and me. For those who proclaim faith in Christ alone, a number of months ago when I was preaching, 
Pastor Lee said this verse, and it resonated with me ever since. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. That's precisely what's just happened. The pursuit of God's children comes firstly from God, but then it requires action from us. We brought nothing to God, deserve nothing from God, but his justice. And that's exactly what the older brother wanted. So look with me to verse 25 to 32. The elder brother is now gonna dominate the rest of this parable, along with his father. So while the younger brother is, re- is representative of the tax collectors and the sinners, once again, the elder brother is the Pharisees and the scribes. Now you can imagine at this point in the story that the Pharisees and the scribes must have thought, the father's crazy, the son's crazy, the story makes no sense, and where is this older brother? Guess who's not on the scene yet from verses 11 through 24? The elder brother. But now, come stage left, here comes the main actor. See, many times you might have grown up reading this lost son, prodigal son, thinking that the main actor was actually the younger son. Truthfully, it wasn't. See, parables have the main point generally in the last two to three verses. And in here, the last seven verses are the main point of this parable. And so it has two parts to it. In verse 25, we learn that the elder brother was in the field. He is not aware of why the celebration is occurring. He sends his servants in to inquire about the festivities, and the celebration begins, but shamefully, the elder brother is not there to support his family, father or brother. Daryl Bach's commentary adds that the elder brother remains outside. Listen to this. He cannot bring himself to go inside. The insider is now the outsider. This is a parable of reversals. So while the Pharisees and the scribes would be wringing their hands thinking Jesus is talking about them, tax collectors and sinners, he now takes the table and he turns it right at them as he does so well. And he levels his attack at the end of this, at the elder brother. And by the way, at the end of this parable is when the Pharisees decided to set their eyes to kill Jesus. So something has happened post this parable that they are very, very, very aware of what Jesus has just said when it's done. The third parable does not end like the first two with joy and celebration, the dead being made alive. Verse 28, look with me. This is the turning point. The older brother became angry and he refuses to go in. This is the demand for justice, the fourth point. He feels it is a just response from the father for what the younger son has done and he's angry and he does not celebrate with the father and he will not celebrate with his brother. MacArthur adds, the prodigal brothers displays a vivid description of how the Pharisees saw things. They disdained that divine grace was sufficient for sinners. Notice the parallel in Luke 15 too. What were they doing? They were grumbling and complaining. Pharisees in verse 29, what are they saying? He's kept all the law, but instead of their love of God overflowing in result of obedience to God, here they are pictured looking at their older brother And look at the words that are said. Look, all these years I have been slaving for you. Have you ever said to your parents that you slave for them? You might have felt it, but have you actually ever said to your mother or father the word look instead of mom or dad? Slaving for you all my years? See, the elder brother wasn't treating the father at all like his father. And the key point here is what's absent, not what's present. The younger son, even though wayward, has the awareness to call him his father. But here, look, exclamation mark, I've been slaving for you. The younger son wants to be the slave. The older son thinks he has been the slave. So here we have the reversal in full effect. These are not tender terms, but reveal the anger in the heart. And so what we see is where is the justice? 
The older son, like the Pharisees, not only wants justice against the tax collectors and sinners, but he wants the reward for himself. Notice the difference from the younger son who comes expecting and demanding nothing. He's destitute and he is depraved and he declares his sinful ways before his father. In verse 30, look with me, the level of hatred now goes to the top. The parable's almost over. He says, this son of yours. Don't lose that point. He is so angry. He is in such hatred to his brother. He can't even refer to him as my brother. He tells his father, which he is now called, look, this son of yours. He has disowned any association of his brother. He levels his tack at his father, really, doesn't he? He's disgusted that the estate has been divided, knowing what the younger brother would have done. And the two parables together end, or the prior two parables t- together end by rejoicing. But here we have the Father God rejoicing and the older brother rejecting, which takes us to the final and main point this morning. The forgiving father versus the unforgiving brother or son. Jesus used this parable to to unmask the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and scribes. They were doing right things outwardly, outwardly, but inwardly they were far from the Lord. While they should have been equally concerned for the lost, the sinners and the tax collectors, their hearts were focused on justice and doing what was right. If you write anything down, this is the words to write down. What is lost must be pursued. What is lost must be pursued. That is precisely the point of this parable. Jesus knew what was lost and pursued it. Hence why he did what? Ate with tax collectors and sinners. And yet, the tax collectors, and, or the Pharisees and the scribes said, look, he's eating with them. Doesn't he know what they are? And he knew exactly what they were and what they had done. What is lost must be pursued. And the father models his compassion for the lost. The younger son comes without excuse, but sincere repentance. He knows what he has done. And no matter what he has done, he knows he cannot be restored He simply wants to serve, but the Father wants full and final restoration. Despite the warm welcome by the Father, the younger son offers his confession. Notice that? That's such an important part to this parable. The Father didn't stop him before he got the words out, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He actually lets that get out and then stops it. And so, friends, the Father forgives because he loves John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So this is why the father rejoices, for the one that was lost has now been found. The Pharisees could not understand why Jesus would associate with tax collectors, but Luke's gospel in 19 gives us this answer, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost, period. And there we have the difference between the forgiving father and the unforgiving brother. So how do we apply this story to our lives to finish this morning? Beautiful transformation comes with humble repentance before God. Beautiful transformation comes with humble repentance before God. If you're not a Christian, I'm not speaking online yet, but eventually, for those here at least, if you are not a child of God, are you not moved by the love of the Father? Are you not? How could you not be? To see him running to the wayward son, to see him embracing the son, to see him kissing compassionately, to see him restoring and reconciling, he will welcome you into the family. He will. See, a lot of you think, well, there's no way that he could based on what I've done and where I've been. This story was the worst of worst of worst sinners that they could have possibly pictured. If you could write your own story and said, this is the darkest person, this is it. 
That's exactly what Jesus has just done. This person is at the bottom of the barrel, no ability, utterly, hopelessly, helplessly lost. Comes back repentantly, and the father runs out to greet him. And that is the picture. But you notice, he didn't just say he came back realizing what he had done wrong. He confesses. He repents. So if you're part of the first camp that is in that place right now thinking that you cannot be restored, you can. But you must come back with repentant, sincere heart. God's word says, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. The Father God desires a broken-hearted people who have learned to mourn over their sin, who come without excuse, based on their background, not on their background or circumstances, but realizing that they have sinned just like all of us and need his mercy and his grace, but do not deserve either. 1 John 1.9 adds, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and he will purify us. It is not enough just to recognize one's sins and turn from them. We must also turn in faith to Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9, Jesus is Lord. If you declare it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, God raised him for the dead, you will be saved. So I have one question for you. Jesus came for the tax collectors and the sinners. He came for you and me. Will you repent and embrace the Father who is pursuing you this morning in love? Secondly, if we, the rest of us, are God's children, transformed, already children of God, then we can say two things. Christ came for us, he took the blame, he bore the wrath, and we stand forgiven at the cross. Praise God. We contributed nothing to our salvation, but once we are saved, here's two points. Then we are to pursue and be burdened for the lost. So are we, am I truly burdened for the lost? If I'm not, then I need to think carefully what this parable is teaching me. We need to be quick to forgive, quick to listen, slow to, slow to speak, slow to anger. Second key point, not seeking justice like the Pharisees. See, often we can look at our own life and compare it to another and say, look at us and compare it to them. Why are they getting that versus me? Remember, fattened calf, young goat. Have you ever been there? Sometimes we can actually look at this and say, well, I kind of understand how the older brother is feeling. But the point of this parable is mercy and grace undeservingly, which first was bestowed to us, and then we are to bestow it to others. And so, we are to display genuine love for one another, even when the other person is most unlovely. For this evidence, this is evidence of our salvation, that we love God and we love one another. Love is active, love is not passive. To be genuine, it must be displayed. Here's the end. The story ends tragically in verse 32. We do not know what became of the elder brother. We have no idea. It's a cliffhanger. Did he turn from his self-focused, justice-seeking ways? Was the love of the pursuing father, did that make any impact on him? It's not a storybook ending. All we know is the rest of the book of Luke, the Pharisee's response was this. Pursue Jesus, kill Jesus, persecute Jesus, torture Jesus. So based on that, it did not end well. But what they meant for evil, God meant for good. But that is another story for another time. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to learn that you pursue your children, that you love us when we were unlovely, that you call us when we were not worthy. And God, we pray, firstly for those that do not know you, that they come to you, that they run to you, that they call to you. For we know that you will accept those that come with sincere, repentant hearts. Secondly, for those of us who are, are your children, help us to live lives that reflect the calling to which we're called. Help us to be overcome with our love for you and therefore spilling out as our love for others. Slow to speak, slow to anger, 
This world is so divided around us, God. Help us to be unified. And God, help us never, ever to tire and sing of your grace forever. We pray, amen. A beautiful taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me leave you with these words from Second Peter and chapter three. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. God bless.